And of course, everybody has seen this picture uh, showing that man evolved some, from some ape-like creature over millions of years. Evolutionists have lots of different charts to get this idea into people's heads, <clears throat> showing how we're related to different kinds of apes, and they map out the, the timeline of exactly when different uh, ape-like creatures came into existence and where man fit into that. They have really complicated trees. And uh, <clears throat> Richard Dawkins, the most famous evolutionist in the world today said, it's the plain truth that we are cousins of chimpanzees, somewhat more distant cousins of monkeys, more distant cousins still of aardvarks and manatees, yet more distant cousins of bananas and turnips. That's what the scientific community wants us to believe, that we're just a higher animal, if they even think we're higher. Well, <clears throat> this kind of teaching and these kinds of uh, diagrams have been very effective. In 2017, Gallup did a survey of Americans' views of, on human origins, and they found that 38% um, hold to a biblical view uh, down considerably from the past. I'm not sure that's even accurate from my travels and speaking, but another 38% uh, they found held to theistic evolution. That is that man did evolve from an ape-like creature, but God was uh, behind the scenes guiding the process undetectably. And then 19%, up from 9% in the past, hold to the atheist view that God didn't have anything to do with the origin of man because there is no God. And so I did the simple math and concluded that 57% of Americans believe that we evolved from some ape-like creature. Is that true? Well, we want to look at that uh, both scientifically and biblically. And uh, to begin with, I want to show you a clip. Uh, it's actually a trailer of a, a movie that was shown in the Natural History Museum in London for a number of years. I don't know if it's still shown, but it features Sir David Attenborough, the voice of science for the BBC in, uh, in England. And he's answering the question, who do you think you really are? So watch and listen. I'm going to take you on a journey, a journey to discover who you really are and where you came from. But you're not just going to sit there listening to me. You're going to be part of the experience and you'll be able to examine some of the evidence for evolution along the way. If you have a look at your screens now, you can rotate the modern human skull and you'll see the domed forehead, the small face, the small front teeth and on the lower jaw, a chin. If you keep looking through your screen, you will see Australopithecus afarensis, an extinct hominid who lived about three million years ago. Deep sea anglers live at a depth in the ocean below a thousand meters where there's no light, so they're living in total darkness. It was our fishy ancestors that first developed some of our most fundamental features, our skeleton, jaws, and four limbs. Hold up your screen and look through it one last time. You'll see the tree that represents all of life, past and present. We started this film with a question, who do you think you are? And we can end it with an answer. You are undoubtedly, like every other living thing on earth, a member of one single family of life, descended from a common ancestor living thousands of millions of years ago. So there you have it. Your great, 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 great grandfather is a little tiny bacterium that popped into the existence in the primordial oceans about three and a half billion years ago. That's scientific fact, according to Sir David Attenborough and the vast majority of scientists today. Now, 
in that uh, video, you saw the evolution tree of life. It was produced by those blue laser beams showing how you are related to all the different animals and plants. And in contrast to that evolutionary tree, we have the creation forest of life. So one of the branches on that evolutionary tree is the branch of hominid evolution. And the evolutionists believe that the orangutan, chimpanzee, gorilla, and uh, modern man, along with Neanderthals, Cro-Magnon, Homo erectus, Homo ergoster, Australopithecines, all these creatures are related to a common ancestor, an ape-like creature. In contrast, uh, creationists who've studied this think that uh, probably the orangutan is one kind of an ape, chimps and uh, gorillas, and maybe Australopithecines are another kind of ape, but mankind would include Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, Homo erectus, Homo ergoster. These are all true humans uh, descended from Adam, just like you and I. So two different ways of looking at the origin of man, the evolutionary view and the creation view. And uh, we need to understand, as we've been making the point all the way along, that everybody has the same evidence to study. They have the same fossils, the same living creatures, the same DNA, but they have different ways of interpreting the evidence because they have a different starting point. The evolutionists are insisting on explaining everything by time and chance and the laws of nature, and creationists insist that the Bible is the eyewitness testimony of the Creator and it gives us the key truths that we need to know to understand and correctly interpret the evidence. And it tells us a lot of details about the origin and history of man. So we're gonna look at this and answer the question, which view fits the facts? And to begin with, I wanna show you some of the things that the evolutionists say, and then we'll look at what the Bible has to say. Now, one of the key creatures uh, in the evolutionary story uh, on the path to leading to man is Australopithecus. Uh, Australo meaning southern, Pithecus meaning ape. So these are the southern apes. And much of the evidence for Australopithecus has come from East Africa, particularly Kenya, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. And one of the most famous Australopithecines is uh, Lucy. You've probably heard of Lucy. Uh, today, more people have heard of Lucy than have heard of Eve. But um, Donald Johansson and his team found the bones of Lucy in 1974. At the time, Johansson was a PhD student at the University of Chicago. And they found about 25% of the skeleton. Uh, it wasn't laid out nice and neatly like this. But um, because of the symmetry of the body, they could reconstruct about 70% of the skeleton. Since then, uh, other scientists have found other Australopithecine fossils, so they now have hand bones and feet bones. And uh, this is the way that the Natural History Museum has pictured Lucy. And I want you to notice that she has human hands, human feet, upright posture, just like you and I stand, but an ape-like face. There are even evolutionists who would say that this is a serious misrepresentation of the fossil evidence and that Lucy and her kind were knuckle walkers, similar to a bonobo or pygmy chimp or gorilla. And so that's the way we've pictured her in our creation museum at uh, the a Answers in Genesis uh, headquarters. Well, that's uh, Lucy in London, but now I wanna show you Lucy in St. Louis because the St. Louis Zoo had a Lucy exhibit for many years, and that's Lucy in St. Louis. Now she has more hair, but she still has uh, human hands, human feet, upright posture, and an ape-like face. And look at that face. Do you see the whites of the eyes? Those are human eyes. Apes don't have eyes like that. You see, uh, those are photographs of real living apes, and their eyes are almost completely black or dark brown. They have to really turn their eyes to the side to see any white that's an imaginary creature created by an evolutionary artist. And just by putting human eyes, which are not preserved in the fossil record, into the picture, it makes the creature look more human-like. Well, that's Lucy in London and Lucy in St. Louis,
but the Chicago Field Museum uh, has a Lucy exhibit, and uh, this is what it looked like a few years ago. Now, she's more robust, but she still has human hands, human feet, upright posture, and an ape-like face, although she has a much heavier eyebrow ridge uh, than the other ones. And then that's Lucy in a BBC television program in 2006. Her hair, her face is completely different from the others, uh, although she does have that unusual hairline, but that's because the BBC is in London and the Natural History Museum is in London. So they got to make those kind of match. So it's just really any way they want to draw her. But then this is Lucy in the Smithsonian Magazine and Lucy in Science Magazine. Well, in uh, 1981, Richard Leakey was uh, then the director of the Kenya National Museums. He's a very famous evolutionist, son of uh, Lewis and Mary Leakey, uh, other paleoanthropologists. And uh, he wrote a book, The Making of Mankind, to teach uh, the general public about human origins. And in that book, he said, we can now say that the Australopithecines definitely walked upright. So is there any doubt in his mind about this? No, they definitely walked upright. But in 1982, just one year later, he was in London speaking at the Royal Institution, a very famous science institute. And there was a reporter from the New Scientist magazine who went to the lecture. Now, the New Scientist is a weekly science magazine published in Great Britain that summarizes the technical scientific literature for the general public so that we can stay informed about uh, science. And it is evolution. So the reporter tells us, uh, Leakey points out that paleontologists do not know whether Australopithecus walked upright. Nobody has yet found an associated skeleton with a skull, he says. Oh, now that's interesting. I wonder how many who read the book uh, were at this lecture to hear that. Uh, the uh, author, the reporter, goes on to quote Leakey. I'm staggered to believe that as little as a year ago I made the statements that I made, so said Richard Leakey before the elegant audience of a Royal Institution evening discourse last Friday. He had come to reveal that the conventional wisdom which he had so recently espoused in his BBC television series, The Making of Mankind, was probably wrong in a number of crucial areas. Now, you see, the BBC realized not enough people are going to read Leakey's book. And so they said, we've, we've got to do a documentary so more people will know what's in that book. But now Leakey is saying he was probably wrong in a number of crucial areas, not little tiny insignificant points, crucial areas. I wonder how many people who read the book or watched the BBC television program were at this prestigious lecture to hear that. In particular, he now sees man's oldest ancestor as being considerably younger than the 15 to 20 million years he plumped for on television. How many TV viewers ever heard that? Leakey says that the basis on which paleontologists classify fossil apes and humans is misleading, and he would like to see an entirely fresh episode of classifying. Well, that was 1982. In 1986, an article appeared in Discover Magazine, a leading science magazine in America, and it was all about Australopithecines and the fossil evidence up to that point. And uh, another leading anthropologist uh, wrote the article, and he begins this way. An extraordinary 2.5 million year old skull found in Kenya was overturned, has overturned all previous notions of the course of early hominid evolution. Now, don't worry about the 2.5 million years. Um, go back to an earlier lecture in this series. Uh, you'll find out why you don't need to uh, trust the millions of years. But if I've had, if I had a dollar for every time I've read in the scientific literature that some discovery has overturned all their previous thinking and some aspect of evolution, I would be a very wealthy man. Well, they found this discovery and uh, now they say, we no longer know who gave rise to whom, perhaps not even how or when 
we came into being. So this, this skull really threw a wrench into their system. Before that discovery, uh, this is a chart uh, from Donald Johansson and uh, Timothy White, another leading American anthropologist. And uh, this is before that discovery. You can see that they have some questions down there at the bottom before they get to Lucy and her kind. And then they're very confident that uh, some of those uh, descendants of Lucy went off into extinction. Others eventually evolved into modern man. Uh, they have that all figured out, uh, although they do have a question about Neanderthal. And then they, they found that skull. And now they don't know who gave rise to whom, when, or how we came into being. Well, they kept digging and uh, they found uh, more evidence, but I wanna now play a video that features another leading American evolutionist, um, Owen Lovejoy. And uh, it's in a clip in a television series, a Nova television on human origins. And uh, I want you to watch and listen to what Dr. Lovejoy is doing to a plaster cast of Lucy's hip bones. And the voice narrating in the background is Donald Jan Johansson, who found Lucy. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bone seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Well, of course it does. He ground it to look like ours. Now, listen, if, an, if a creationist did that to the fossil evidence or plaster cast of the fossil evidence, he would be crucified. He would be criticized severely. But an evolutionist does it. This is good science. No, this is not good science. This is a manipulation of the evidence to fit a preconceived idea. Well, what did Lucy look like? Well, the bones don't tell us because we just have bones. We don't have any of the soft parts. The very same head uh, can be made to look more ape-like or more human-like depending on the color of the skin, the color and amount of hair, and the color of, of the eyes. And artists have many interpretations of how Lucy may have looked, as we've already noted, based on assumptions and beliefs. So here are some images of what Lucy may have looked like. Those heads, the, the, the hard part, without the skin color, without the hair, without the eyes in there, those heads are all identical. Uh, they were created by our artists at the Answers in Genesis Creation Museum. And all the artists did with the same starting head was uh, put different kinds of hair, uh, different amounts of coloring in the skin, and uh, human-like eyes or ape-like eyes. You can change that, that hard skull part to make it look like anything you want. Here's, uh, here's how the evolutionists do it. Picture of Lucy, who's an astralopithecine, and uh, Tong Child, an astralopithecine. Tong Child is more human-like than Lucy. Um, here are two different versions of Tong Child based on the same Fossil evidence, the bones, the skull. You can just make it look more ape-like or more human-like depending upon your perspective. An article about these visual depictions of our evolutionary past said this, flip through scientific textbooks illustrating ideas about human evolution 
or visit any number of museums of natural history, and you will notice an abundance of reconstructions attempting to depict the appearance of ancient hominins. Spend some time comparing reconstructions of the same specimen and notice an obvious fact. Hominem reconstructions vary in appearance considerably. In this review, we summarize existing methods of reconstruction to analyze this variability. It is argued that the variability between hominin reconstructions, those are the ape-like creatures leading to man, is likely the result of unreliable reconstruction methods and misinterpretation of available evidence. We also discuss the risk of disseminating erroneous ideas about human evolution through the use of unscientific reconstructions in museums and publications. The role an artist plays is also analyzed and criticized given how the aforementioned reconstructions have become readily accepted to line the halls of even the most trusted institutions. It's art and imagination and the assumptions and perspectives of the artist that is speaking more than the actual fossil evidence. Well, you remember that first video that I showed you from uh, the Natural History Museum in London. This creature walked onto, this, onto the screen and uh, Sir David Attenborough said, Australopithecus afarensis. That's Lucy, according to them. No, that's not Lucy. That's Lucy or something similar. And even some evolutionists will agree though they won't publicly agree with a creationist. Lucy is not our relative. Well, what about Neanderthal man? Well, the first Neanderthals were discovered in uh, the Neander Valley in Germany in the 19th century. And um, they were used in the Scopes Evolution Trial. A professor from the University of Chicago said, there can be no question that Neanderthal man was much more primitive, more simian, ape-like an organization than modern man. Hugh Ross and his organization reasons to believe uh, they don't accept what the Bible says about uh, the origin of man, at least not all the details. And they say that in their model, it identifies hominids like Neanderthals, Homo erectus and others as animals created by God. These extraordinary creatures walked erect and possessed enough intelligence to assemble crude tools and even adopt some level of culture. The RTB model maintains that the, that the hominids are not spiritual beings made in God's image. The RTB's model reserves this status exclusively for Adam and Eve and their descendants, modern humans. Well, we'll look at uh, whether that view is consistent with scripture or not. But... Um, when the, the bones were first discovered and identified as Neanderthals, this is the way they were pictured in 1856. Uh, they were rather robust, stooped in the shoulders, ape-like in the head, and not wearing very many clothes. Of course, the clothes are not preserved in the fossil record, so that's pure imagination. But they found more Neanderthal skeletons and, and bones uh, in various places in Europe, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. And there are now even evolutionists who would say that if you dressed up Neanderthal in a coat and tie and a top hat and put him in Grand Central Station in New York City or the Chicago Central Stain Station, um, nobody would even take a second look. In fact, there was an interesting article back in uh, 1994 in Time Magazine it was entitled The Changing Faces of Neanderthal. And they showed how Neanderthals have been represented over the years. So here, here he is in uh, 1873 in Harper's Weekly. Um, he needs a haircut, but otherwise he can be an American Olympic athlete. But then in 1909, he's ape-like in the head, but human otherwise, and naked. In 1953, uh, in, a, in a movie, he's uh, behaving like some humans, but he's ape-like in the head. Then in 1984, uh, in another movie, he needs a haircut and a shave, taught not to eat live frogs or mice, whatever he's got there in his hand, but he's human. In 1988, he's showing us that he needs to go to the dentist, but he's human. 
But then uh, CNN has him more ape-like in 2006. He's got a lot more hair in 2007 in Newsweek, uh, but he's perfectly human in Science Daily. The Neanderthal Museum for many years had um, an exhibit where they showed the 1909 version and the 1983 version. And one evolutionist commenting on this said, from his bestial 19th century persona to just another guy in a suit, Neanderthals have been pigeonholed according to the times. Well, the uh, Neanderthal Museum, like any good museum, has updated their uh, exhibits. And so this is what the Neanderthals looked like in, uh, in 2010. Now, the man on the left has been out in the sun a little bit too long, and he does have a pretty big nose. But when I'm out speaking and I look at the audience, I see some of those people have a pretty big nose. And so I'll say, you know, I'm wondering where some of you are on the evolutionary tree. And that, that brings a chuckle. But he's human. There are people that look like that, and they, those other two, I'm sure there are people that could look like that. Put them in regular clothes, they could look like that. Yes, but then people object and say, but the Neanderthals were primitive. They had, they had primitive stone tools, they had primitive culture. That proves that they weren't fully human. No, it doesn't. When George Washington was president of the United States, living in the presidential palace there in Philadelphia with Persian rugs on the floor and fine china and a toilet in the house, living in the very same country at the very same time where Native American Indians living in teepees with no Persian rugs on the floor, no fine china, and no toilet in the teepee. And they were just as human as George Washington. And we have people today that in our Western arrogance, uh, we call them primitive People like the Aborigines of Australia. Um, they're different from us, they have a different lifestyle, but there are Aborigine children that go off to university and you could drop, be, drop me by helicopter into the forest where they live with just the clothes on my, on my body. And even though I have a university degree and a PhD, I would probably be dead in three days. I wouldn't know how to make a boomerang uh, or spear. Uh, I'd probably eat some poisonous plant. They're different from us, but they're fully human. Yes, but then people object, but the Neanderthals lived in caves. That shows that they weren't fully human. No, it doesn't. In 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered on the uh, west side of the Dead Sea in Israel. Copies of the Hebrew Old Testament and other ancient Jewish writings that were put in clay pots and stored in those caves by a group of Jews called the Essenes who were living out there in the wilderness just before and after the time of Christ. And did you know that the Bible speaks of cavemen? There are no ape men in the Bible, but there are cavemen in the Bible. Hebrews 11 speaks of men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. There are a lot of caves in Israel because of the limestone rock. And uh, the Bible tells us that Sarah, Jacob, Lazarus, and Jesus were buried in a cave, just like Neanderthals buried their dead in a cave. And Lot, Elijah, and David lived in a cave for a while. Why did they live in a cave? Well, because the necessities of life required it. God told Lot to get out of Sodom. He was going to, to destroy the city, and Lot uh, went up into the mountains into a cave. Elijah was uh, running from King Ahab, and David was on the assassin's list of King Saul. And if you're running for your life, a cave is a really good place to hide. The archeological evidence that Neanderthals were fully human is just overwhelming. They made uh, sophisticated spears, needles, and stone tools. Now, a bird will use a piece of straw to get a bug out of a tree. Uh, a monkey might use a stick to get ants out of an anthill. An otter might use a, a, a rock to break open an oyster on its belly. But animals don't make tools. Only humans do that. They used makeup and made seashell jewelry, and painted art in caves. They hunted dolphins and seals and dove for living mollusks. 
and uh, humans are the only land creatures that do that. They used fire to cook food. They made glue and uh, maybe ropes and nets. They made flutes from bear femurs and headdresses from feathers. They cared for their sick. There's evidence they did surgery. How did they figure that out? Uh, how did scientists figure that out? Well, they've looked at some Neanderthal skeletons and they've seen evidence of healing uh, where uh, apparently a, a bone was set or uh, even uh, possibly brain surgery. They ceremonially buried their dead and uh, no animals do any of that. They made and sailed boats and they had the hyoid bone and the voice box, which uh, scientists say is almost identical to that of modern humans. They had anatomically modern human ears and they had the speech associated gene FOXP2 and there's evidence that they interbred with humans. They had children with modern humans. And so um, this is how they are pictured uh, even in uh, modern times. Those look like humans. I mean, they're a little scruffy and they aren't smiling, but they are humans. Well, this article says that they are intellectually equal. Understanding and use of twisted fibers implies the use of complex multi-component technology, as well as a mathematical understanding of pairs, sets, and numbers. Added to recent evidence of birch bark tar, art, and shell beads, the idea that Neanderthals were cognitively inferior to modern humans is becoming increasingly untenable. So was published in the scientific reports in 2020. A few years ago, I was speaking in California, giving a, a, a lecture similar to this, and uh, this man came up to me and he said, you've got to use me in your, in your talks in the future. I said, why is that? And he said, uh, well, I've had my DNA tested and I'm 3% Neanderthal. I said, really? He said, yeah, I'm from Lithuania. Well, he wasn't primitive. He was, uh, he was in technical support for Android, so I'm sure he was a lot smarter than me. But he's not just the only Neanderthal man. Uh, that's a picture of two Neanderthal men because uh, modern research, genetic research says that all humans except uh, black Africans have one to 3% Neanderthal DNA. Well, here's a reconstruction of a Neanderthal child's face. And I would just ask a question. Does she look subhuman and ape-like? Well, the Neanderthals, as we've noted, they did uh, paint art in caves. And here's a picture of some of their art. A couple of years ago, I did some art in my office. And um, in my humble opinion, that Neanderthal art is infinitely better than mine. Um, they were gifted people, artistic. Well, not like the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, are an extinct type of human, we're told, that interbred with Homo sapiens. Some people in Asia and Australasia today carry remnants of Denisovan DNA in their genomes. Our species may have been interbreeding with Denisovans as recently as 15,000 years ago, say these evolutionists. According to a detailed analysis of the DNA of people living in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, we already know that after Homo sapiens first migrated out of Africa, well, that's the evolutionary view, uh, our species repeatedly interbred with a number of now extinct hominin species, including the Neanderthals and Denisovans. The signs are in our DNA today. All people of non-African descent carry some Neanderthal DNA, while some Asian people also have Denisovan DNA. Well, here's another reconstruction of Neanderthal. And you can see how you can take the skull and depending on how you imagine the soft part to be, you can make uh, that person look pretty human. And um, he had a pretty strongly receding uh, forehead and heavy eyebrow ridge. But uh, a couple of years ago, I was speaking in Amman, Jordan, teaching a course at a seminary there. And this was one of my students, he was from Chad. And he had much more pronounced cheekbones and uh, his head was a little bit more square at the top. And then when we compared the side view, um, my forehead is, is very vertical, whereas his is receding. But 
He was an excellent student and just as human as I am. Here's a skull of a Homo erectus, supposedly 1.8 million years old. But here's a, a Malaysian man who has very pronounced eyebrow ridges and receding forehead. The Neanderthal skull, skull on the right and uh, a revolutionary hero. Again, the soft tissue, the hair, is not preserved in the fossil record. This is a uh, former world uh, heavyweight boxer. He had very pronounced eyebrow ridges and receding forehead. But he was a very smart guy and he actually went on to become a member of the parliament in Russia. Here's another example of how art can uh, significantly change based on the soft parts which are not preserved in the fossil record. So this skull is made to look like it's very ape-like. Uh, the same skull can be made to look perfectly human. Uh, and th again, the, the heavy eyebrow ridges are not proof of any kind of evolution, nor is the receding forehead. So you have all these different creations of evolutionary artists, and they supposedly live some uh, 3,800, 38,000 years ago, Cro-Magnon man. They, they all look human, no difference. The analysis showed that the genetic difference values separating the three human species were smaller than the difference between, differences between modern animal species like brown bears and polar bears known to produce healthy hybrid offspring. So we've got one mankind and several species, just like we have one bear kind and several bear species, but it's, it's all the same kind of creature. And there really are not many species of man. There's just mankind, all descended from Adam. In a biology text that I had uh, referred to in the last lecture, it's worth remembering that they say biologists define a species as a population or group of populations whose members can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Well, those uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans and modern people, uh, they, they could produce fertile offspring. They're all the same kind of creature. Here's another statement by evolutionists about these species classification. Scientists are hung up on an increasingly outdated concept of what constitutes a species. It's commonly taken to be a group of organisms that can interbreed. But this biological species concept is just one of dozens of competing definitions. Some are based on shared ancestry, some uh, others on shared behavior, genes, or anatomy. And so we can conclude that Australopithecines were 100% ape, and Neanderthals and Denisovans were 100% human, just like us. We're all members of the same species or mankind, all descended from Adam and Eve. We'll uh, defend that statement uh, more when we look at the scriptures. But let's consider here, in terms of the fossil evidence, some more missing links that are really problematic. Piltdown Man was announced in 1912. Uh, the uh, Illustrated London News had a picture of what he looked like based on the evidence. It was a piece of jaw, two molar teeth, and a canine tooth, and a piece of skull. That's all the evidence that they had. And the Geological Society of London made a very confident interpretation. They said he was uh, half a million to a million years old. And they said that the bones leave no possible doubt, but that they represent a man who must be regarded as affording us a link with our remote ancestors, the apes. So no possible doubt about this. Well, uh, the bones went into the Natural History Museum in London. There were other artistic representations in the following years. Uh, this one more ape-like. But there were scientists who said, you know, we would like to look at those bones. And the Natural History Museum said, we would, be, we would be happy to show you plaster casts of the bones. They didn't let anybody look at the actual bones for 40 years. Finally, in 1953, they let some scientists, they were actually evolutionists, look at the bones. And what they discovered was 
Well, before I tell you that, I want to remind you that at the Scopes Evolution Trial uh, in 1925, a professor at the University of Chicago said, the most ancient English human relic has been called the Dawn Man of Piltdown. And that was used to make uh, the, the case for evolution. But in 1953, what they found was a hoax, a deliberate hoax. And uh, I want to show you what they did to make that hoax. Because uh, Dr. Carl Werner, who is a medical doctor, went over to London and he got to see and take photographs of the plaster casts and the real bones. And uh, here are the plaster casts of that canine tooth. That's the actual tooth. It's been filed. Yes, the teeth were filed. Those are the plaster casts of the uh, molars, but those are the actual teeth. They've been filed. The bones were also artificially colored to make them look old. It was a deliberate hoax, and it fooled a lot of people and was used to brainwash the public for at least 40 years, if not longer. Well, then there's Nebraska man. And the Illustrated London News had a picture of what he and his wife were doing when they lost the only piece of evidence that was found. It was a single tooth. And from that tooth, they reconstructed the whole scene. Well, they kept digging there in the, uh, in the dirt there and in, in the rocks in uh, Nebraska. And by 1927, they had found more fossil evidence. And in a technical article, not in a, a general newspaper, using a technical scientific name, not using the name Nebraska man, they quietly announced, oops, we made a mistake. That wasn't an ape man. That was actually an extinct species of pig. So um, that's the real Nebraska man. And I like to say, this is the case when a pig made a monkey out of a man. Well, Chris Stringer is one of the leading uh, evolutionists studying human origins. He's at the Natural History Museum in London. At least he was when he made this statement in a book review on a book on uh, origins. The study of human origins seems to be a field in which each discovery raises the debate to a more sophisticated level of uncertainty. True to the traditions of the field, the arguments swirl around the questions of the correct classification of the fossils and of the presumed relationships between the species of humans and prehumans. So they keep finding evidence, but it's just leading them to a more sophisticated level of uncertainty. Well, let's look at Boxgrove Man. The evidence was found in 1994 to 1995, and they told us what they found. One shin bone which they said was clearly human. Two teeth, which they said were clearly human, but not found close enough uh, to the shin bone to necessarily be from the same individual. They said they found primitive stone tools, which they said were clearly human artifacts. Well, I want to show you a picture of what they said this Boxgrove man looked like. There he is, perfectly human, perfectly human. Oh, no, ape-like in the head. But the only evidence they have from the head are those two teeth, which they said are clearly human. And uh, they dated him to be 300,000 years old. But actually, the evidence points to him being 100% human. And based on where the bones were found, creationists would say that he was a post babel uh, somebody who migrated from the Tower of Babel uh, after the flood. Then there was this argument that appeared in National Geographic in 2000. I couldn't believe it was in the magazine. Uh, I'm going to show you everything on this one-page article. It had a picture of these six bones and a piece of jaw. And it said, It's hard to find someone who can draw a realistic-looking early hominid. That's why the Art, a Geographic's art department conducted a search for new talent. 
Four artists were picked to receive casts of two million year old female Homo habilis fossils. From these bits of evidence, and now that's accurate, isn't it? Bits of evidence. They were to sketch in skeletal and fleshed out form the hominid to whom the bones belong. So here's, here's the assignment. We want you to look at these bones and this piece of jaw, and we want you to draw a complete skeleton, and then we want you to draw a picture of what the creature looked like when it had muscles and skin and, and hair, everything. Well, the article goes on. Each artist had two weeks with the bones before they were sent on to the next persons, says coordinator Chris Hanna. Research was completely up to the individual. That's why their work looks so different. There's no one way to draw her. Now that's a significant point to keep track of. The article uh, ends, paleoanthropologists reviewed the results, intrigued with all four entries. The art department has invited artists to paint finished versions based on input from the consultants. But I just have a question. How will that help? Because the paleoanthropologists don't have any more fossil evidence than the artists. And they're not as good at art. Well, would you be interested to see what they drew? Well, even if you're not, I'm going to show you because this is very educational. Now, let's start with the head. All they have from the head is that piece of jaw. And remember, there's no one way to draw her. So let's see what they drew. Ape-like head, more human-like. Ape-like head, ape-like head. Now I'm going to show you the rest of the body. Uh, but before I do, I need to remind you of two facts. The first fact is they only had six bones. But there are 207 bones in the human body. So that's not much to work with. But you need to note something else about these bones. And that is they are bone fragments. They're not complete bones. So the artist is going to have to guess, well, how long was the bone when it was a complete bone? The second fact you need to remember is that um, humans have an arm to leg ratio of three quarters to one. Uh, if I could stand up straight, my hands would come to the middle of my thighs. But apes have much longer arms. If they could stand up straight, their hands would come down to their knees or even farther. Now they all had the same bones, the same six bones. None of them were complete bones. Let's see what they drew and remember, there's no one way to draw her. Human length arms, getting down to ape length arms. Human length arms with curved hands to kind of give it that tree dwelling look. And this one's in a tree and those arms are looking awfully long. Folks, this is not science. This is art and imagination in National Geographic, arguably one of the most influential evolution propaganda organs in the world. Uh, that was 2000. In 2001, Daniel Lieberman, a prominent American paleoanthropologist, wrote a technical article in Nature, and uh, he said this, until a few years ago, the evolutionary history of our species was thought, thought to be reasonably straightforward. Well, I would dispute that just on the basis of what I've uh, discussed already. But he goes on to say, Lately, confusion has been sown in the human evolutionary tree. The confusion now looks set to increase still further. So they're getting more confused as time goes on. And, and look at the chart in his article. Down the left side, you have the, uh, the time, the millions of years. And then you've got those bold bars of blue, green, orange, black, red. That, that represents the fossil evidence. And then you've got those black lines with uh, question marks on them. What's that? Well, that's not the fossil evidence. That is the evolutionary assumed relationship between these. So let's get rid of the black lines and question marks so that we can see the fossil evidence. And that looks like different kinds of creatures have always been different kinds of creatures, just like Genesis says. 
Then in 2006, an article appeared, Lucy's baby, an extraordinary new fossil. And they showed us the evidence. That's the stuff in orange. White is imagination. And they told us what the evidence was. Shoulder blades and neck vertebrae like a gorilla. Inner ear canals like African apes. A long curved finger like a tree dwelling ape. But now look at this. The only evidence they have from this creature is that one finger and a little bit of the upper arm bone. The rest is imagination. But they've made the arm the length of a human. They said it had a voice box like a chimpanzee's, cranial capacity like a chimpanzee. So all the evidence is ape. But look at the way they drew the picture. Uh, a little uh, barrel chested, but ape-like in the head and uh, human length arms and it looks like it's standing up with its ankles positioned just like we would stand up. Well, I didn't give you the whole title of the article. It wasn't Lucy's baby, an extraordinary new fossil. It was Lucy's baby, an extraordinary new human fossil. And that article appeared in Scientific American, one of our leading science magazines. What they should have said, based on the evidence, was a new ape fossil. And if they'd said that, there wouldn't be any reason to publish the article, because who cares about an ape fossil? So what is this? Well, it's more ape man deception in one of our leading science magazines. Well, there's another discovery in 2017, an artist's reconstruction of Grycopithecus freibergi left from the jawbone and tooth found in Bulgaria and Greece. Oh, wait a minute. The jawbone was found in Bulgaria and the tooth is from Greece and they say that's from the same individual? Uh, there's a lot of imagination going on here. And then in 2019, we get an announcement of another new species uh, found in the Philippines. What did they find? Well, they found over a 12-year period, a toe bone, a foot bone, two finger bones, a partial femur, and premolars. That's all they had. And usually with these, these uh, fossil finds, they're very limited in what they find. Well, I didn't give you all of the title of the article. Dr. Menton studied the evidence. He uh, recently passed away, went home to be with the Lord, but for 34 years, he was a professor of human anatomy at Washington Medical School in St. Louis. He was an expert on these questions. He knew human anatomy and studied the evolutionary claims of ape men. He said, this is clearly an ape. But in the article, they talked about a new species of human, Homo luzonensis. This is more evolutionary imagination.